This is Nightly Business Report with Bill Griffith and Sue Herrera. Where's Santa? That's what investors are asking as stocks are routed once again. Is there any hope the jolly old fellow makes a pit stop on Wall Street to end the year? D.C. drama, a partial government shutdown, Treasury calls to the banks to reassure investors, and the president continues to attack the Fed, all creating a hangover for stocks. And down to the wire, shoppers are still out there getting last-minute gifts, and that's making retailers happy for the holidays. All that and more for this Monday, Christmas Eve, 2018. And we do bid you good evening, everybody, and welcome. Sue has the night off. For those on Wall Street expecting Santa and reindeer today, it was not meant to be. Instead, we got the Grinch and growling bears as the S&P 500 is now 20 percent below its most recent high, which defines a bear market. We also got the worst Christmas Eve performance for the Dow and the S&P ever. That's right, ever. Turmoil in Washington continues to hang over the markets. We'll have more on that in just a moment. But let's take a breath and look at today's final numbers. The Dow lost 653 points. That was its low of the day. It closed at 21,792. The Nasdaq, which entered bear market territory on Friday, fell another 140 points today. And the S&P dropped by 65. Bob Pisani tells us if there's any hope for a last-minute appearance from St. Nick. No doubt investors will find it tough to get into the holiday spirit this year, but could there be any hope for a year-end rally? Maybe. You might have heard of the term Santa Claus rally. The Santa Claus rally begins today, and that's the tendency for the market to rise in the last five trading days of the year and the first two of the new year. You know, it's good for an average gain of 1.3% in the S&P 500. That's pretty good for seven days. Now, the usual explanation for this is that the first half of December is dominated by tax loss selling. You sell your losers, and once that's completed, you try to buy some stocks for the new year. And since volumes are typically light in the second half of December, a modest increase in buying interest produces a modest rally. Now, that makes some sense. But the Santa Claus rally is usually framed in the negative. If Santa Claus should fail to call, bears may come to broad and wall. The S&P 500 has averaged a loss of about 1.2 percent in the subsequent three months following a failed Santa Claus rally versus an average 2 percent gain after a Santa Claus rally succeeds. If there is any hope for a Santa Claus rally this year, well, here's the key question. What's the right price at which the buyers are going to emerge? Let's, so let's assume something. Let's assume flat earnings next year. That's not the assumption. Most people assume 8 percent. But let's assume flat earnings of $162 for the S&P 500. That means no growth next year in earnings. What's the right multiple? With a modest slowdown, the right multiple for the S&P might be between 14 and 15. So let's say 14 and a half. That would produce a price of about 2,350 on the S&P. That's almost where we are now. We're just above it. That's pricing in an awful lot of bad news for next year. But at least it's a target. At this rate, we could hit that early next week. Still time for a rally. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. Now to Washington, where concerns over the possibility of the president firing Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell and where the Treasury Secretary Mnuchin called the heads of six major banks over the weekend are all keeping Wall Street on edge. Steve Leisman takes a look at what's going on there. Christmas Eve 2018, traders thinking about sleigh bells, Santa and snow instead get a serious stock market sell off. It's impossible to know what brought on the worst Christmas Eve stock decline ever. Fed rate hikes or economic weakness concerns. But fingers are also pointing to actions of the Trump administration and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. We just didn't need more bad news. We did not need Mnuchin and to be confused by the commentary that he was talking about. We didn't need a government shutdown. This just adds to the negativity that we already have out there and the concerns we already have out there, mainly on trade, in my opinion, mainly on the Fed and on international growth slowing. Among developments, Monday afternoon, the president continued his war on the Fed, tweeting, quote, the only problem our economy has is the Fed. They have no feel for the market, don't understand trade wars or strong dollars or Democrat shutdowns over borders. Earlier in the day, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin convened a special meeting of the president's working group on capital markets described as a, quote, check-in to discuss coordinating government functioning during the shutdown. But special meetings have typically only happened amid serious financial blow-ups. On Sunday, 
The Treasury Secretary issued a statement saying he talked to the heads of the six biggest banks and they assured him there is ample liquidity. But no one seemed to be asking whether there was a liquidity problem. On Saturday, there were several reports the president was asking whether he could fire Fed Chairman Jerome Powell, something the Treasury Secretary later tweeted that the president now does not believe he has the authority to do, but never denied the president was asking the question. I think there are people in the White House who recognize that, that sort of communicating that the president is interested in getting rid of Powell is not a productive strategy. And on Saturday, at the stroke of midnight, the government entered its third partial shutdown of the year. Fears of a weakening economy are real, as are concerns that Fed rate hikes will have negative consequences. But on Christmas Eve day, the focus was on the Treasury and the White House, not on a white Christmas. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman. With 2018 nearly in the books, our next guest says now is the time to add value and growth names to your portfolio. Nancy Tangler is back with us, Chief Investment Strategist at Nancy Tangler Wealth. Merry Christmas. Welcome back. Merry Christmas, Bill. Um, you know, it's either John Templeton or Warren Buffett who is famous for saying, buy when fear is the highest. Is that where we are right now, do you think? I think we're darn close if we're not already there, Bill. I think it was Warren Buffett that also said, you won't know who's naked until the tide goes out. And I think we've seen a lot of investors, and particularly those who are passively invested, buying more of stocks as they go up. And now is a time when you want to be um, invested with an active manager who's looking, or you be active yourself, who's looking at quality and valuation. Now, we have a, a list of stocks that you're looking at right now, and the first one is Apple. And regular viewers of this program will know that virtually every single money manager we've had on this program recently has picked Apple. And my joke is, if you liked it at $230 two months ago, you must love it below $150 <laughs> right now. Why Apple right now? I guess just because of the decline? Yeah, well, two things. Um, this stock has reached a similar valuation before in 2012 when it hit $700 a share pre-split. And it was trading at about nine times when it became super interesting to people like Carl Icahn and eventually Warren Buffett. But for those of us who slug away at this every day, uh, what, what we know about Apple is a couple things. One, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary brand and an extraordinarily well-managed company that's been raising the dividend 10, 12 percent a year and is now trading at 2 percent. And that, that's been historically a pretty attractive time to step in. It's back to trading at nine times earnings if you back out the cash. And, and you have to believe that no one's ever going to buy an iPhone again right. if you think that this company is not going to um, resurrect itself and grow again. Services right. is growing at 25, 30 percent a year. What do you say to those folks who are watching who are very nervous about this market, and I imagine a lot of people are, uh, it, it, the, the decline may not be over yet, right? I mean, what do you make of what's going on on Wall Street right now? This has been a very sharp decline this month and, and much of October as well. Yeah, you're right, Bill, sharp and quick. Um, yeah, so I would say a couple of things. One is that we've seen this before. We've seen markets sell off eight times in the last 50 years at the bear market level with no recession in sight. And we usually see a, a, a correction of anywhere between 10 to 20 percent every single year. But I think what has people uh, so unnerved, and those of us who have been doing this 30, 40 years, like myself, is, is the rapidity of the decline. And, and that, we think, has a lot to do with the algorithms. The computers are at it again. There. Yes. Nancy, yes. thank you for stopping by. Again, Merry Christmas, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me. Nancy Tangler with Tangler Wealth Management. Stocks are lower for the year, but there still has to be a best performer or least worst performer, and healthcare is one of those top sectors. Down about 2% so far this year. Bertha Coombs takes a look at the winners and losers in that group. Healthcare continues to see relative outperformance to the overall market, but the pullback this month has now seen the S&P 500 healthcare sector give up all of the year's gains. The healthcare sector has obviously been a major source of app performance this year. We've seen it peter off, I think, in part because of the relatively overbought condition. The medical device subsector is a big example of investors taking profits on stocks that have seen big rallies. While still up for the year, the fourth quarter has seen big losses for the sector's high flyers. Like cardio device maker Abiumed, still up for the year, it is still trading at more than 60 times expected earnings per share 
after a 35 percent plunge this quarter. Analysts at UBS say in the year ahead, demographic fundamentals of an aging population still favor device makers. The continued expansion of Medicare Advantage also bodes well for the health insurance sector, which has held on to a 4% gain for the year. But the legal challenge to the Affordable Care Act could weigh on the sector in the year ahead, especially for Medicaid-aligned insurers like WellCare, which is up for the year, but has lost nearly a third of its value in the fourth quarter. The Trump administration's proposed rules on Medicare drug pricing will pose a major headwind for drug makers in 2019, like Regeneron, the maker of high-priced eye treatment Ilia, which could see reimbursement slashed. The stock is down 8% for the year. The overall biotech sector is down 14% for the year. But by contrast, traditional drug makers have held up relatively well during the fourth quarter pullback, as investors have looked to traditional safe havens. And now we may see sort of a rejuvenation of that with the breakdown in the market. Again, with that potential sort of boost to defensive posturing, at least the pharmaceutical stocks should be pretty well insulated in that environment, at least from a technical standpoint. Indeed, Merck and Pfizer are the Dow Industrial's best performing components year to date. Their 3% dividend yields, no doubt, making them attractive to investors in a defensive market. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bertha Coombs, New York. Coming up, the final push. It's the final few hours to shop for those Christmas presents, but does the recent drawdown in the stock market keep people away from the malls this Christmas season? We'll tell you when Nightly Business Report returns. With all the talk of an economic slowdown, the consumer does not seem to be listening right now. The Wall Street Journal, citing MasterCard's spending pulse, says that total U.S. retail sales, with the exception of autos, rose more than 5 percent between November 1st and December 19th. And they're not finished either. It is estimated that about 7 percent of holiday shoppers hit the stores this Christmas Eve, and they were out over the weekend as well. Leslie Picker is, too. She's in Danbury, Connecticut, for Crunch Time. It's Christmas Eve, and with gift giving just hours away, a certain type of shopper is on a mall mission, men. I gotta do some last minute Christmas shopping for my family. Last minute shopping. This is like super last minute, you know, like this is my first time shopping. I shop my best when I'm under pressure. Everything's last minute. The men, they're crazy. They wanna wait till the last minute. Yes, when it comes to Christmas shopping, the biggest procrastinators are typically men. According to the consulting firm Customer Growth Partners, men buy more during the few days leading up to Christmas, which is why items like jewelry and purses tend to be popular purchases during that time. Toys and electronics, on the other hand, are bought more frequently on Black Friday because consumers fear the stores will run out of stock. While the stock market has plummeted since Thanksgiving, the shoppers at the mall on Christmas Eve said it isn't impacting their spending. That said, analysts think the weakening market may ultimately affect sales. Retail is, is not having a wonderful Christmas time from an investment perspective right now. But I think shoppers are clearly out there. They have been spending. Um, footfall, however, is still down mid-single digits year over year. So that's not all that encouraging, especially since the online business comes at a lower margin. The share of spending online does appear to be growing this season, however. Data from MasterCard found U.S. e-commerce sales jumped 18 percent year over year between November 1st and November 19th. But the biggest procrastinators may have little choice but to step foot in a mall. About 7 percent of Americans are still shopping for those last-minute gifts on Christmas Eve, according to a survey by the National Retail Federation. Even though it's Christmas crunch time, no one here at the mall appears to be panicking quite yet. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Leslie Picker, Danbury, Connecticut. Well, let's talk now about uh, how the retail sector may fare this holiday season when all is said and done. Joining us for a third time this holiday season, Charles <laughs> O'Shea, the re lead retail analyst at Moody's. And I assume we're two guys. I'm yeah. finished with my shopping. Are you? 
a okay. couple hours ago. Okay. <laughs> okay, you didn't. Yeah, I think so I'm you, done. You were among the last minute shoppers yeah. out there. When we talked on Black Friday, correct me if I'm wrong, you were on the high end of forecast for sales mm -hmm. at around 5% for yeah. this holiday season. Yeah. Have you raised that now? No, I think we thought five to six. Okay. And I don't know that we were hedging or not. And we normally don't do that, but we decided to do it this year. We went positive on our outlook for the next 12 to 18 months for the sector. And we wanted to put a little more meat on the bone, so we, we came out with a holiday sales forecast. There are a lot of tailwinds driving the consumer right now. And we felt that, that those were going to really show themselves during the holiday. And I think that you'll see that, and I think you'll see 19 be a pretty good year as well. The job market certainly is strong. That, yes. that helps. But the stock market doesn't help that old wealth effect as we talk about. I think for the holiday, and I think we talked about this when I was here last time, right, right. middle and lower income families really focus on Christmas. And no matter what happens, they seem to find a way to pull a rabbit out of a hat and make Christmas good for their families. The upper end consumer is still pretty resilient. They'll have a Christmas as well. So I think that when you look at the two barbells here on the demographic side, the bottom can, can kind of offset some things that may happen to the top. And one of the things that you kind of hope for if you're looking at that luxury buyer is that they bought early before the market started to get a little squirrely. Before we look ahead, uh, mm -hmm. be, beyond Christmas, uh, the usual suspects uh, you still feel are the ones that benefit the most in terms of the yeah. retailers here. Yes. The Walmarts, the Targets, the uh, Best Buys. Yeah. Who else? TJX, Amazon, Costco, Home Depot will do well, although that's not such a big holiday business, although they sell a lot of Christmas trees. I, I, what we're seeing is a continuation of the thesis that we've had for a while where big is better, the bigger, stronger guys are going to exploit the weak. I've used the term retail Darwinism. I think that still applies here. The more money you have, the better your balance sheet is, the more you have to invest, the, the, the better able you are to build the things you need to build to compete with the Amazons of the world. Okay, I got two more quick questions. Okay. One, this is the first Christmas without Toys R Us. Yes. A number of them were scrambling to pick up that business. Who's going to win? Amazon, Walmart, Target. And then the battle at the, for the second tier will be Best Buy. And then some of the niche guys that got into it just to get into it. Okay. After Christmas, after the new yes. year. Does reality set in of some kind? What happens to the retailers, do you think? I think the strong still, serve, still will do well. I think what you'll see in the early part of 19 is a lot of the weaker retailers decide whether they're going to be there or not. We've got a lot of debt maturing, maturing in 19 and 20. We've got a lot of distressed retailers. We've got 35 names in our B3 and below list now. That's where you know, you're going to separate the wheat from the chaff here in early 2019. Well, I enjoyed uh, our conversations during the season. Uh, Thanks, Bill. See you so after did the I. holidays. Okay. Well. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, too. Charlie O'Shea with Moody's joining us tonight. Apple is reportedly facing a boycott by Chinese consumers, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. Japan's Nikkei newspaper is reporting that Chinese companies are instructing employees not to purchase Apple products in response to that arrest in Canada of Huawei's CFO. In some instances, companies are issuing fines or threatening to fire those who don't comply. Apple shares finished down more than 2.5% today to 146.83. Software developer MindBody said it's planning to go private after spending three years on the NASDAQ. That company, which creates platforms for fitness and spa businesses, is selling itself to a private equity firm for nearly $2 billion. MindBody is also being given a 30-day window to consider more attractive offers if they come forward. Shares of MindBody skyrocketed, though, nearly 65 percent today, closing at 35.83. Private equity firm Apollo Global is reportedly in talks with Chinese conglomerate HNA Group to buy technology product distributors Ingram Micro. It's being reported that HNA wants to sell Ingram Micro for $7.5 billion, including $1.5 billion in assumed debt. Apollo Global Management shares were unchanged today to 23.75. Small cap drug maker Accorda Therapeutics is in, uh, said that its Parkinson's disease treatment has been given the green light now by the FDA, and shares of Accorda rose 6% to $13.77 as a result. Netflix market share is growing. The Guardian newspaper says the streaming giant will have more subscribers than British broadcaster Sky by the end of this year. Netflix expected to end 2018 with about 9.7 million U.K. subscribers. And shares were down about 5% today to 233.88. Kraft Heinz and Mondelez have now reportedly been shortlisted for the second round of bidding for Campbell's international business. Reuters says that both Kraft and Mondelez 
are interested in acquiring the foreign portfolio to expand their own global footprints. The business could sell for as much as $3 billion. Shares of Mondelez, Kraft, and Heinz uh, and uh, Campbell's were all lower with the rest of the market today. Well, we're all familiar with identity theft, unfortunately, you know, where someone pretends to be you to make purchases, to apply for credit, even get your tax refund. But did you know that the same could happen to businesses? And it's on the rise, as a matter of fact. Business identity theft was up 46 percent last year, according to Dun & Bradstreet. Andre Day has our story. It's really easy for an attacker to impersonate a business. Imagine criminals taking over your company and running it as their own without you having a clue. Cybersecurity pro Brian Vecchi. For a business, it could be months or even years before they realize that something's wrong. It's called business identity theft. At stake, your brand, reputation, even trade secrets. FBI unit chief Stephen Shapiro. They'll actually take on their client lists or the special sauce that makes that company operate and compete with them directly. In other instances, they're pretending to be that business. Have you seen recent cases where businesses are hit with this type of attack? Yes. He won't disclose names, but says a recent case cost the company one billion in market share and hundreds of jobs. How tough is it to spot? Depending on the business, it can be very difficult to spot. He says criminals can open phony social media accounts that look legit, even start making and selling goods. What makes this so enticing for criminals? Criminals have a perception that it's easier to find a business's data than there is for individuals. There's also a perception that businesses have deeper pockets than an individual would in an identity theft situation. At risk is the very reputation of that business. Veggie is in the business, business of protecting those reputations really at Veronis. This is absolutely something that could happen to any business, not just the really big ones. A lot of the information that you would need to impersonate a business is publicly available. Their names, the names of the corporate officers, the addresses, the phone numbers, the email addresses. He says the attack can start with a data breach from the outside. 58% of companies that we looked at last year had more than 100,000 folders open to literally anybody who joined their network and none of it was monitored. And he says don't discount threats from within. Insiders are incredibly difficult to protect against. First of all, they know more about your organization. If they really want to do some damage, they can do it very quickly and very efficiently. So what can you do? Well, the pro's best advice is to restrict data to only the workers who need it and make sure when someone leaves the firm, they're totally cut off. Also, keep a close eye on credit reports. And if you are a victim, report it right away to the FBI. That's IC3.gov. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Andrea Day. Up next, what Hollywood is hanging its hat on for the holidays. The King of the Seven Seas conquered the box office this weekend. Warner Brothers and DC Comics' Aquaman brought in $72 million in its debut, which includes previews. Disney's Mary Poppins Returns came in second with $22 million. Paramount's Bumblebee finished a close third with a shade under $21 million. Well, the holidays are not just for shopping. They're also a key period for movies with a range of new titles opening and looking to draw audiences. So how does the box office compare this year? Julia Borston is in Los Angeles with a look. The holiday box office between Thanksgiving and New Year's is a crucial time for movie theaters and studios. That holiday stretch generating 17% of last year's box office. Here you are, enjoy. Christmas week alone often topping half a billion dollars at the domestic box office. I was flying the kite when I got caught on a nanny. This year, three big franchise films opening ahead of Christmas. Disney's Mary Poppins Returns, <laughs> Warner Brothers Aquaman, <laughs> and Paramount's Bumblebee. They're hoping to draw moviegoers through New Year's with their familiar characters. For the last three years, we've had a Star Wars movie opening in mid-December. We don't have that this year, but we do have a cadre of films, a nice slate of films that collectively 
could really boost that box office to a level that rivals that of that one Star Wars movie. Even without a Star Wars, this year is well on its way to a box office record. Comscore's Dergare Bedian predicts the domestic box office will end the year somewhere between 11.6 and $11.9 billion. That's thanks to record-breaking films such as Black Panther and Avengers Infinity War, both from Disney's Marvel, driving Disney to dominate box office market share this year. But it's not just franchise films out around the holidays. I want you to be my VP. On Christmas Day, independent Annapurna Pictures is opening drama Vice about Vice President Dick Cheney, one of many holiday movies looking for awards attention, along with Fox Searchlight's The Favorite and Focus Features' Mary, Queen of Scots. With IMAX and AMC shares down this year, they're hoping to end the year with a box office bang to drive interest in audiences for next year's batch of films. This really is an important time for the studios and the theaters to do a full court press on audiences who they're trying to rev up for the slate that's to come in 2019. And next year is expected to set another box office record, again on the strength of Disney films, including Captain Marvel, a Lion King remake, Frozen and Toy Story sequels, along with another Star Wars. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. Before we go, one final look at the day on Wall Street, the worst Christmas Eve trading day ever, with the Dow down 653 points below 22,000, NASDAQ and the S&P also down more than 2%. That is it for the, uh, this edition of the Nightly Business Report. The markets are closed tomorrow, but we will be here with a special Christmas edition. Hope you can join us. Have a good evening. See you tomorrow.